Welcome to Virtual Insights Exposed to the Elements, a conversation on conservation. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight um, and for sharing where you are joining from. My name is Persephone Allen, and I'm curator of programs and engagement at the American Folk Art Museum in New York City. As many of you know, our museum is dedicated to uplifting the work of self-taught artists across time and place, and we're thrilled to celebrate our 60th anniversary this year. As we begin tonight's discussion, I want to acknowledge that I am both joining from and our museum stands upon Lenape Hoking, the unceded traditional homeland of the Lenape Delaware peoples, and we honor Lenape people past, present, and future. Uh, we're going to start tonight with brief introductions, followed by a dialogue with Jenna Nick, introducing us to the fields of conservation and conservation science, before taking a closer look at works from the American Weather Veins exhibition. Here you can see um, a curlew weather vein from that show, Dr. Mass's research on vein surfaces, and broader questions of how surface treatment decisions are made. This evening's conversation is being recorded and will be published online in the coming weeks, so we hope you'll revisit it. Closed captioning in English can be activated by clicking on the CC button at the bottom of your screen. And uh, we invite you to share questions for our speakers throughout the program by using the Q&A feature also at the bottoms of your screens. Uh, we'll make every effort to respond to as many of these as possible at the end of the discussion. Thank you again for being here and for donating to sustain ongoing virtual experiences like this one, which would not be possible without your support. Our program tonight is inspired by our current exhibition, American Weather Veins, The Art of the Winds, curated by Robert Shaw, coordinated by Emily Gibalt, with additional interpretation by consulting scholar Joseph Zordon, and now on view at our galleries at 2 Lincoln Square through early next year. We hope you'll visit it um, to see these works in person, and for those interested, you can reserve your tickets online for free, uh, as well as order your copy of the accompanying book. The show presents over 70 objects related to the production, collection, and interpretation of weather veins as tools, as works of art, and as objects prized as much for their formal beauty as for their variegated surfaces, which evidence their age, their long histories, and years of exposure to the elements. So it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers tonight, conservation scientist, Dr. Jennifer L. Mass and conservator Nick Pedamonti, who will lead us in thinking through how these unique objects are studied, cared for, and preserved. Dr. Mass is the Andrew W. Mellon Professor of Cultural Heritage Science at the Bard Graduate Center in New York City. She's an expert in the study of chemical and physical structures of the surfaces of works of art, and has been studying weather vein finishes in particular for over a decade. She has published her research on their evolution in both Antiques and Fine Art Magazine, and in the book accompanying our current exhibition. Uh, this brilliant essay inspired tonight's discussion, and we are so honored to share this virtual space with you um, and with Nick Pedamonti who is currently a conservator at the National Museum of African-American History and Culture in Washington, DC. He was previously an associate curator, a conservator at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, where he was part of a team responsible for the research and conservation of the collection from the Michael C. Rockefeller Wing. His conservation career spans over a decade and has included work on the Northwest Coast Hall Collection at the American Museum of Natural History, treating wooden artifacts from the British galleries at the Met, and the treatment and study of Delarobia's resurrection lunette at the Brooklyn Museum. So many of us are probably familiar with all of these objects, um, which Nick has worked on. So at this point, I'll turn it over to you, Jen and Nick. Thank you. Thank you so much, for Persephone, for that the incredibly kind introduction. And I would like to start us off um, by also saying thank you, everyone in uh, the audience and the Folk Art Museum for inviting us to speak tonight. And um, let me see if I can advance my slide here. There we go. Okay, so we're starting off with a bit of a tongue twister here that I always stumble over, a conversation about conservation. And so thank you for joining us as we look at several different aspects of uh, the conservation of um, weather vanes and the preservation of uh, their wonderful surfaces. 
So it makes sense to start out with um, an overview of the field of art conservation. Our field is predominantly made up of art conservators uh, like uh, Nick, but there's also a small contingent of scientists in the field as well. Um, chemists like myself, but also um, physicists, geologists, um, materials engineers, biologists. This isn't even a complete um, list. There's plenty of structural engineers involved as well, but it gives you a sense of how many different scientific disciplines um, interface with art conservators. And together, you can think of us as sort of the doctors for our global cultural heritage, where the scientists are often involved in the diagnosis and um, the treatment, uh, the treatment is really the focus of the conservators and we tend to work together on preventive care. And we do this very careful painstaking work because we consider it to be a moral imperative to preserve these objects for future generations. And there is also a bottom line in terms of countries that uh, do depend on tourism, for example, for their economies. Just uh, echoing Jennifer's comments and thanks to the uh, American Folk Art Museum for our ability to sort of uh, have this conversation. Um, Jennifer and I have uh, collaborated in the past, worked together, and I think it's uh, so in light of that, you know, we're sort of introducing both uh, our perspectives on weather veins from our respective uh, professions. So to do so, I think it you know helps to sort of um, define what we do in terms of the terminology, what it is, what is a conservator. Um, so bear with us if uh, deserve, if you're already familiar with it. Um, otherwise, uh, this will help sort of uh, clarify any um, areas in which uh, you may not be as uh, uh, clear on. But essentially, a conservator is uh, very often the person who is uh, physically in a uh, physically in contact with the object of cultural heritage, usually at the highest amounts. So they're usually the ones with the hand skills or the technical knowledge, and very often the ones who uh, uh, we're after, we have to make the decisions to preserve this tangible history. But very often we're always doing this, always in collaboration with many of the, the other disciplines. So luckily the buck, to, you know, it, the responsibility doesn't fall entirely on me. <laughs> but ultimately the decision that I do make is supported and backed up by all these other professions and affiliated fields. Um, so I really, you know, that collaborative aspect of what I do is sometimes lost in the sort of popular narrative. Uh, furthermore, um, the training, the backgrounds, there's always a lot of uh, background in art history and science and studio art. And I think um, there's a reason for that in the sense that because of this collaborative nature of conservation work, um, we uh, we inter we interact a lot with scientists and curators, especially in the museum environment, such as the Met, where you have dedicated scientists and curators that are coming at it from the history and the scientific side. And we need to be able to sort of be in dialogue with many of these professions. So having uh, a background in these areas helps with uh, sort of um, understanding and interpreting. So if Jennifer comes to me with uh, a spectra or data or a graph or something, <laughs> it's not completely uh, um, lost on me. Um, furthermore, um, we're one of those few fields that has uh, a strict training in an ethical uh, background, because um, very often the choices that we make will echo for generations. And we experience this very often on many objects that not only carry with them their sort of lived experiences in a sense, especially for weather vanes, they've been outside, they've been exposed to the elements, but very often they also carry them uh, sometimes the ill-advised or ill-considered treatments of past generations that um, were not always uh, friendly to its surface or structure. Um, so oftentimes uh, conservators are always dealing with sort of past treatments. Um, so it's not always sort of this pure, that's almost never, this pure approach to an object that's been untouched. This is very, very rare. Um, so especially in the objects that have never been touched, that's always we, what we always want to talk to scientists about because we want to understand what exactly existed. So um, I just want to put that into context. And we, I've worked in both museums and in private uh, capacities 
uh, for historical museums as well. So um, conservators are a little bit everywhere. Um, they both do a lot of the hands-on treatment, but sometimes conservators are working in consulting capacities um, for preventive uh, conservation regarding collections. Um, as we all know, um, you know, there's not enough people to sometimes work on many of the cultural heritage that we have. A good example is sort of graveyards and cemeteries where um, there's just not enough people. So uh, there, there's people who go around and train and sort of support uh, local initiatives. Um, so, uh, but they bring with them that knowledge and the experience and skills to sort of uh, engage in those communities. So conservation is sort of, uh, we're always sort of treading all these different areas and different lines and professions. Um, but I wanna emphasize that it's very collaborative. Um, so uh, if Jennifer, if you wanna advance the slide or have anything else to add to that. I guess I, I would like to say that that is one of the most fun things about what we do is um, getting to get the perspectives from the conservator who knows so much about the history of technology. And sometimes I can collect the data, but I can't put it into context without my conservator colleagues and likewise with my art historian colleagues. And so it's a real pleasure. And uh, I wanna echo what Nick said about um, graveyards, that there is so much work to be done and just not enough people in the field to, to do this work. Uh, and and so I, I I wanted to also sort of bring this to weather veins, of course. And uh, these are sort of some of my thoughts regarding the conservation of weather veins. And this is, we'll touch on this in further slides and future slides and again towards the end, but I sort of wanted to sort of uh, plant a seed at this stage before we get into sort of a little bit more detail. Um, and it starts with this question is like, uh, essentially what is the aim of a treatment? And by treatment, I, I think I should also put that into context. So when, um, think of it in the same way that a doctor treats a patient, it's usually the actions that they do or employ upon a work or tangible piece of cultural heritage that will then preserve ideally preserve it into the future indefinitely. And so the actions essentially is summed up in the word treatment, the actions that a conservator uh, uses and does. So the question, the first question that comes to mind is what is the aim? What is the goal? What is the goal of treating a weather vane? Um, and what is the, the end purpose? And so to answer those, we have to ask all these other questions. And very often, uh, whenever anyone asks me any question related to conservation, my, my first answer, my automatic answer is it depends. Because there's so many questions that I have usually before I can even consider. And so many of the treatment decisions are usually very um, tailored um, and they're tailored design specific for the object. Yes, there are some uh, uh, areas where you know that, you know, copper is going to have these certain things going on. You can see in many other copper pieces, but very often the treatment comes down to sort of what is the goal. So what are, so the first question is that comes to mind is what are the materials used? Um, what is the condition, both on the surface and the structure? Um, at least in this case, in this image, we have sort of a, a variety of corrosion byproducts on the surface. So the first come, question that comes to mind regarding copper is sort of, is there active corrosion? And these are things related to sort of condition and stability. And then sort of one of my last things that comes to mind is uh, what are the intentions for display and for the stakeholders? Um, this differs depending on whether you're in a museum or you're working on a piece for a private uh, collection. Um, and of course, whether it's a functional object, uh, an architectural setting is very different than a display wall in the American Folk Art Museum, for example. And so, you know, these objects are, you know, uh, they're recontextualized depending on the settings in which they're placed. And that, of course, informs the, the conservation decisions that uh, would be taken. So in a nutshell, my first thought is I look at the structure. Um, is it falling apart? Is it broken in half? You know, very often the pieces, you know, if they're in good condition and held together and they're not falling apart, um, my, my instinct is sort of don't touch it. <laughs> so, um, my, my, my initial thoughts are always structural stability. And then a second, you know, sort of secondary thought is the aesthetic. 
um, looking at the surface considerations. And that's, that turns into a conversation. Um, and it and again goes to sort of uh, the questions for Jennifer and for scientists and for anything that I could potentially do to sort of understand the surfaces. And I have my limitations and that's where Jennifer fills in where I leave off. Um, so my approach generally is minimalistic. Um, and like we can get into more details later, <laughs> but because surfaces are incredibly complex and corrosion in general is an incredibly complex uh, subject um, that people are still trying to understand fully. I mean, there's like this billion dollar in industry <laughs> to understand and to arrest corrosion. So um, what we're trying to answer the questions to is still very much a mystery. We understand a lot, but there's still uh, many questions. Um, but leading to sort of our, our next slides with Jennifer is my first question is, what are we looking at? What is the object? What is its substrate? And by when I say substrate, I mean, what is its uh, base material? Is it made on copper? Is it made on iron, wood, uh, the zinc? Is it a combination of those things? Um, my first thoughts are, what, what is the base, the substrate? And then what is it finished with? How is it finished? Um, and then I immediately look at the condition because that immediately informs my conservation approach. And so leading off to you, Jennifer, in terms of where we go from there. Terrific, thank you, Nick. All right, so uh, there can be a real romance uh, behind uh, patina and a real allure of uh, materials degradation. And I'm showing some examples here of objects that are degrading in a particularly beautiful way. And so we have these magnificently iridescent ancient Roman glasses where the iridescence is caused by leaching of um, sodium or soda out of the surface of the glass, causing the surface to collapse. And it was considered to be so beautiful in the 19th century that Lewis Comfort Tiffany, among others, um, came up with some modern technologies to recreate this phenomenon. And I'm also looking at a piece of um, Greek bronze armor from the Metropolitan's collection. And that soft, fuzzy green surface that you see on the bronze is really magnificent and something that we would never consider removing in the conservation field today. It's considered to be evidence of the life history or what we sometimes call the object biography. And even architectural ruins have a certain um, peacefulness and beauty and romance to them. And so when do you resist change and when do you embrace change? Something we think a lot about in art conservation is what's called the agents of degradation. What's acting on the object? Is it relative humidity, the moisture that's in the air or oxygen or even pollution in an urban environment like um, sulfur dioxide. And we'll look at some examples of that. And uh, just as Nick was going over uh, all of the different things that a conservator does when it comes to cultural material, I wanted to do the same thing for conservation scientists, because this might seem like a very unusual profession. And it's true that in fact, there aren't very many of us, uh, very many of us people that spend our careers at doing um, molecular and elemental and microscopic analysis of um, museum objects. And some of the questions that we address in our work through these scientific studies are questions about authenticity and attribution, which sometimes we run into and are surprised by when we weren't looking for them. And then um, Nick alluded to the whole restoration history of an object of art that the field of art conservation has only really existed in um, a formal sense since the 1970s, but people have been restoring objects of art ever since objects of art had been made. And so there's literally thousands of years of undocumented restorations that we have the potential of finding on an object. There's a whole new subdiscipline in art history called technical art history that involves studying the technology of manufacture of um, museum objects and cultural heritage objects and gives us so much information about the technology of the past. And I put in um, 
italics here are degradation mechanisms because some of the most important work that we do as scientists working on cultural objects is we want to understand why they're changing so that if necessary those changes can be either slowed down or even potentially stopped altogether and um, also Nick made a great point about the ethical considerations involved in what we do that as a scientist working in art conservation I'm charged with doing my work either totally non-destructively without taking a sample at all or in a minimally invasive and destructive way sorry um so um if I do take a sample from an object it's Think about the size of a period at the end of a Times New Roman 10 point sentence. And that's the largest sample I'm gonna take from an object and it's gonna be from an unobtrusive location on the object. That would be about a milligram or a thousandth of a gram. But in fact, we even um, take and can get a tremendous amount of information from microgram size samples, a millionth of a gram, which you really can't even see with the naked eye. We need a microscope to get samples that small. So uh, I hope that many of you had have had the opportunity to see the exhibit. The finishes in the exhibit are just absolutely amazing, as are the veins themselves. And I wanted to um, try to put a little bit of organization around the concept of uh, the various different finishes that we see here. So sometimes we talk about polychromed finishes. Those are painted finishes, and they um, rarely survive in their original form, but often we can get traces of the original paint in order to identify what a polychromed object might have first looked like. And typically with wood, um, because it's an uneven bumpy substrate, there's going to be a priming layer prior to the painting. And sometimes, but not always, you'll see that on the metal veins as well. Then we're also going to look at what's called a verdigris finish, which is in reality a bunch of different types of copper corrosion products, and then look at the technology behind um, gilded surfaces where we have not just gold leaf, but a priming layer and a gilder sizing layer, both of which are critical for the survival of the gold leaf. And you're seeing a little bit of the yellow gilder size in this horse here. So I wanted to show this uh, one example of um, what makes a desirable finish. And I mean, the reality is a desirable finish is whatever finish you desire. Some people really like the verdigris surfaces. That happens to be my personal preference. Some people like the fully gilded veins. And uh, we see a lot of interest in these variegated surfaces where you have some gold, some yellow gilders priming that we're seeing here, some copper corrosion. And then in this case, this is a particularly um, fabulous finish because we have a weighted um, zinc head mounted to a hollow copper body. And Nick, did you wanna say something about the um, appearance here? Yeah, I was just, um, what well, usually comes to my mind and, and I, Jennifer and I had discussed a little bit about sort of these, uh, these different deterioration phenomena. And I think this is a perfect visual impression of what we're looking at, where we have sort of the gilding that had survived in the copper um, preferentially to the gilding that had um, that had been applied to the zinc. And you know, what comes to my, what what comes the question that comes to my mind as a conservator is why, right? Why is it that all of that gilding and the surface is lost on the zinc? And so much more is retained on the copper, and you know part of that can be answered through analysis. And I think Jen, you would be able to tell me whether there's been multiple campaigns. What you know, what do we have? You know, in a sense of that is that surface the second or third or fourth campaign of refinishing it? How has it been preserved? How has it been coated? Um, but still, it sort of brings into question also the structural issues of having. Um, a solid zinc element soldered or, you know, and this is probably the case of soldering with a copper sheet and sort of uh, thinking about um, the weather phenomena and how that affects those two different materials. Um, zinc is 
notoriously um, brittle. Um, it can, it is more malleable when it's heated. So like, so we're thinking of different, uh, you know, heating conductivities of the two different materials and how they're gonna, you know, sort of heat up differentially compared to each other, how that's gonna play a role on its soldering, how it's gonna play a role on the finish that's underneath it or over it. So, and uh, furthermore, like the, the, uh, the corrosion byproducts of both materials are gonna have also a different uh, experience or a different reaction to the, the surface that's, um, that's on them. So I think you can see here that zinc, uh, I think <laughs> it's one of those things where um, the analysis definitely helps explain it. But we can see with our own eyes that um, surface finish and gilding does not last as long. And that's where we can start with our, you know, sort of interpretation. And then, of course, that goes into more, you know, and we can dig deeper and really try to understand this. And this, of course, would enter, you know, sort of enter into the question, into the, uh, the conversation about what to do about it. Do we leave it as is? Do you re-gild the, the zinc, you know? And, and that's where you're, where you're talking about, Jennifer, in terms of what people's preferences are in terms of the visual uh, appearance of a piece and its aesthetic. Is it even possible to sort of bring it back to an old age look? I think this is the age look. I wouldn't do anything to this personally, probably. So, but these are all sort of questions kind of float around in my mind as a conservator, so. I agree. I wouldn't, you can see I wouldn't the do ears, anything to this. The ears are also copper. You can tell. Yeah, it's really it's really great composite object, and then this is really just a magnificent gilded surface. And these surfaces were very sought after early on in the history of people collecting veins in the 1970s and 80s, for example. There's so much gilding um, extant here that this is unlikely to be the original gilded surface. And it may be something that was done in the early 20th century or potentially after the vein was taken it down out of its architectural context and became a, a piece of folk sculpture. In terms of the technology that goes into applying gilding onto outdoor architectural ornament, it's more complex that you might imagine. You can't just put gold leaf directly on top of copper and think that it's going to stick. In fact, um, right directly on top of copper, we usually have an oil-based primer and frequently this will have a lead-based pigment or a lead dryer in it as well. The oil's hydrophobic. It's actually gonna repel water and help keep the copper from corroding. And then next up will be a bright yellow um, gilder size, usually based on lead chromate and also yellow ochre. And then sometimes, but not always, you'll have a layer of either a drying oil or a plant resin. And then the gold leaf is applied on top of that oil containing layer. The reason for these two layers is that when these very thin sheets of gold leaf are applied to the surface of the object, they have to be burnished and uh, they have to be basically rubbed with a uh, dog's tooth, for example, as a common burnishing tool. And um, the yellow ochre combined with the lead chromate is a nice soft surface to burnish the gilding on because of the shape of the clay minerals in the yellow ochre. But also the lead chromate combined with the yellow ochre gives this golden color. And so if there's not, um, a good um, contact between two adjacent layers of gold leaf, you'll have what gilders sometimes call a holiday where there's a little space between the gold leaf and you get a golden color exposed rather than the copper color exposed. So this yellow gilder sizing, which is so beautiful and I'm showing two magnificent examples of it here. And this is the chemistry behind it, that lead chromate I mentioned, the yellow ochre and the clay that's so important for getting the good adhesion of uh, the gilding. And so it seems like a complex surface, but it does what we need to do. We need it to do in terms of helping the gilding to hang on to the copper and protecting the copper from the um, elements. So in terms of the uh, approach that we use to weather vane finish analysis, we want to identify all of the materials that we find 
and uh, the order in which they were applied or in which they were formed. And so we use a technique called cross-section microanalysis that I'll show some examples of. And so if uh, I take that tiny sample off of a uh, weather vane and um, mount it up in a block of polyester resin, then I can polish it to expose the edge of the layer structure, just like when you slice into a layer cake, you can see the layers in the cake. We do the same thing with these finishes and we can get some really, really beautiful effects when we do that. Our molecular analysis tends to be molecular fingerprinting techniques um, called FTIR or Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy or Raman microscopy. And together, these give us really all the information that we need about the patinas that we're seeing and the pigments and binding media as well. Oh, also should, I should mention that there's many other <laughs> techniques that are applied to uh, the study of cross sections. And we're not listing them all here, but <laughs> I think uh, it's, it's worth noting that there is a, a whole industry, you know, of analytical instrumental analysis that do this. Absolutely. Yeah, we really have our, our pick and our selection of instrumental techniques really gets better year after year in terms of new innovations for materials analysis. Um, I wanted to point out here that I think there's this common misunderstanding that veins were always completely stripped and then regilded, but in fact, that's not the case. And we very commonly see multiple layers of gilding. The scale bar that we're looking at here, 100 microns, is equivalent to the thickness of a single piece of my hair. So that's how small the sample is. And the priming and sizing layers are typically around 20 microns, one um, fifth of the width of a human hair. And the gilding is so thin, we can barely see it at high magnification. It's about um, two to three microns. And so one fiftieth the width of a human hair. And so it shows up just as these bright dots in the cross section. So this is a gilding layer here. And then you can see new gilder size has been applied and then a second gilding layer here. I wanna talk also about the verdigris surface and what this all these materials are that form the verdigris surface. Well, this is actually um, copper corrosion from the copper substrate of the, the weather vane. When you think about mining copper, it's typically not mined in the metallic state. It's mined as ores like um, copper carbonates, like malachite or azurite. And when copper is exposed to the elements, it goes through a remineralization process where it converts back to its mineral state. And what minerals you get really depend upon the environment that the object is in. And so if you're in an urban environment where there's a lot of um, sulfur dioxide due to um, pollution in the atmosphere, um, that gets converted into sulfuric acid and you wind up with these copper sulfate minerals, broken tight and antlerite. And so these are shown here and you can see the magnificent, beautiful colors. And that those are the beautiful colors that we see forming on the weather vanes. But if you're on Cape Cod or even anywhere on the East Coast, the possibility of exposure to chlorides from sea spray means that you can get copper chlorides such as atacamite and paratacamite. And so, for this whale vein, for example, you might expect to see the copper chloride corrosion because you've got this sort of nautical um, theme here. And on a farm animal, you might expect, for example, a copper carbonate type corrosion. But I wanted to point out there's like a very soft and powdery look to the verdigris surface. And that's a result of the minerals actually growing in a perpendicular way out of the surface of the copper. It's like this fine fuzz that develops on the surface of the copper. And that effect is ruined if the vein is covered, for example, and this is something we wouldn't do today, but that might have been done in the 1960s or 70s with an acrylic resin, then you lose that softness to the patina. So that's not something that we like to do. And this is just uh, 
wonderful example of a very blue verdigris surface. So verdigris can range from blue to green and a lot of black that you see on the surface. In this case, we're just looking at um, corrosion of the lead tin solder, but the, the black is often copper sulfides and copper oxides that have formed on the, the object too. And then I can't not talk about the Warren Dragon. The Warren Dragon is so amazing. This comes from Warren, Pennsylvania. And so this is inland. And so we can expect that the dragon surface that we're looking at here is going to be a combination of the broken tight and antlerite minerals. And you can see how beautifully soft um, the surface is, is a result of how they grow. And a close-up look at the surface here and some of the minerals. Can I just jump in and add, Jennifer, um, about uh, the uh, the different sort of corrosion byproducts? And you you listed a number of them before, and just even a lot more than that too. But um, we always think about sort of something corroding as always being bad, as like this has this qualifying factor. And you know, I think a lot of people sort of see this and think, oh, it's meant to be green. You see these you know bronze sculptures, and they're green. You know, the you think the intention is meant to be for green. So oftentimes it's not, but even still, there's um, this assumption that corrosion is bad. And I think in rust, when we're talking about rust on iron, very often that is true. <laughs> and uh, but for copper, copper is sort of this uh, incredibly comparatively uh, really quite resistant material in uh, the natural environment. Um, it erodes very slowly. I think it was. Uh, I think I saw some studies saying. I think. Uh, a tenth of a millimeter, no, yeah, about a tenth of a millimeter a year, maybe less. So um, I think the, but just to sort of talk about sort of these bad and good, um, they're all sort of these, most of these uh, layers are passivating in the sense of like when you have bare copper, it's just copper and its first sort of corrosion byproduct is copper oxide, cuprite. And that's sort of that darkish brownish red layer that covers sort of this gleaming shiny piece of copper or bronze piece uh, that comes out. And that's a, essentially creating this passivating layer and it protects it from the environment in a sense, in many ways. And I think a lot of these other sort of corrosion byproducts are doing essentially the same thing. Um, in, in many ways, they're, they're considered stable, quote unquote, stable um, uh, corrosion byproducts, but there are some exceptions and that is sort of uh, I think I've discussed this with Persephone and Jennifer but um it's a, a material called uh, bronze disease but we rarely see these um uh, we rarely see these in uh um sorry um we don't see we don't see this very often and I think uh this is usually a copper uh, chloride and this is cyclical process and it's very fuzzy and it's and it causes deep pitting in copper. And I don't know if Jennifer, have you seen these? This is a question that comes, I don't, I don't know, I'm not as familiar, but have you seen sort of this uh, copper chloride sort of quote unquote bronze disease? Um, and, you, and you referenced it before, tachymite and paratachymite, um, that's sort of this byproduct. And it's something to be always sort of looking on the lookout for um, because it can cause deep pitting in copper. So that's one of those things that I'm always looking out for when I'm looking at sort of condition and uh, surface stability, because it's a sort of a tricky thing to treat um, when we're looking at copper. That's usually the thing that always, the flag that always comes to my mind. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, you're, you're absolutely right. I completely agree. And oftentimes you can recognize bronze disease because you get um, almost these like raised pustules of uh, corrosion forming on the object. And even though we do see some of the components of the chemical components of bronze disease here, like the copper chlorides, no, I have not seen an active corrosion that I would be concerned is actually going to eat through the substrate um, in these objects like you sometimes do in antiquities. And I wanted to bring up this train, not only because it's gorgeous, but all, all, and it has a fabulous patina, but also because it's from Boston and talk about what happens on the East Coast where you have the combination of the urban environment and the coastal environment and 
the Statue of Liberty is another great example where um, you have um, sea spray, you have exposure to chlorides and then also exposure to um, urban pollution. And there you do see what you might expect, the mixture of sulfates and chlorides. And this is a great example of the sulfate uh, finish from Salem, Ohio. And you might see an intentionally patinated surface, a patina that's been added after this um, concept of having a verdigris surface became so desirable. And so artificial copper corrosion, if you want to produce a dark brown or a blackened surface, that can be done with this fabulously um, named product, kind of an alchemical name called liver of sulfur, which is really a mixture of potassium polysulfides. And this is something that um, gunsmiths use that you could buy in um, a number of uh, different places, or even just exposing what I often see is the vein being exposed to nitric acid to give a nice blue green finish. This is a technology that was invented in the 19th century, but wasn't done originally for these veins. I've even read uh, about people burying veins in manure. Manure gives off carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide and can give actually a very beautiful patina and mixtures of copper sulfate and acetic acid are used to produce a uh, false patina as well. So the question of original surface comes up a lot in folk art. And um, I mentioned already this misconception that surfaces are always going to be stripped. And in fact, um, we don't see that. We see that when we take samples of the finishes, we are able to reveal the history of the object more often than not. And so sometimes we'll see up to five finish campaigns on a single vein. and. That's a good result, just like it is in American furniture. Something I always ask people to look for is the bullet hole repairs, especially in the Midwest. You see people um, shooting at the weather vanes to make them spin around. Kids would shoot them when they were bored. And so you, you want to look for lead and the, or lead tin solder repairs and see if the gilding goes over the repair or not to have an idea about whether it might be original gilding or not. And um, this cross-section is kind of crazy, but I wanted to include it because it shows how an object can go from being gilded, um, and that's at the bottom right here, to polychromed. This is brass leaf here, and then this is an aluminum leaf. And so what we see on the vein now might be very different from how it was decorated originally. So what should we expect for a weather vane that's been outside for 75 years or 125 years? Well, we should expect the surfaces to absolutely be weathered and have mixtures of the yellow priming, the verdigris, and uh, the gilding. And something, a question that I get asked a lot is, how long do we expect gilding to last on an outdoor architectural ornament? And there's lots of publications that say, oh, by five years, you know, the original gilding is going to be gone. And that's likely true if you don't have any priming layers. But with the priming layers that we've showed, we're seeing more like 50 years. And when you've got an oil priming layer, and again, the oil is kind of repelling the water in the environment and protecting the copper from corrosion. And you can see greater than 50% of the gilding survive. So I wanted to take a look at the Angel Gabriel here, and I can see we're probably not going to have time to go through all of our examples because it's been um, so much fun just talking about how we work. But um, as I mentioned, polychrome um, veins, it's very rare to see the original surface. And uh, Gabriel's made in around 1840. And sure enough, when we look at cross sections of Gabriel's finish, what we can see on the left is ultraviolet light and on the right is visible light that Gabriel originally had an orange surface. And so this is the priming layer and then paint. And then there's a lot of accumulation of surface dirt and organic finishes, second priming layer and second painted layer. And so that's the red in the, the trumpet here. And so we can get a sense of the 1840s finish versus a finish that was applied far later.
And we can take these tiny cross sections and put them into our spectrometer and do our molecular fingerprinting to show that the original red that was painted, uh, that the trumpet was painted with, and without even getting into what all of these peaks mean, but just by showing that I'm pattern matching here with a database that has thousands and thousands of artist materials and minerals in it, that we have an iron oxide red being used, which is um, certainly appropriate for the 1840s. And the chrome yellow is also present that I mentioned earlier in the, the yellow. And then we also use a second molecular fingerprinting technique, infrared spectroscopy. And what I love about the data here is that it tells us that our priming layers are actually lead sulfate white, which you almost never see for indoor paint. You only see it, or, or for example, easel paintings for that matter. What we see instead indoors is lead carbonate white rather than lead sulfate white. But in the 19th century, they knew that the lead carbonate whites were going to react with the environment and turn black over time as they converted into lead sulfide. But the lead sulfates were more stable. And so you see this great use of um, this great understanding of the materials that the craftspeople were working with and how they would change over time. I wanted to point out um, the red dye that's been used in Gabriel's lips right here. And so you have a color change or a palette change in how Gabriel originally looked. Some more molecular analysis confirming um, vermilion, uh, mercury-based red in uh, this case, and chrome yellow. And then in the pink cheek, we have um, something that was originally pink, but now is being made in the second finish with an organic dye rather than an inorganic pigment. And these are very light sensitive, but now that the weather vane is indoors, we don't have to worry about that as much. I also wanted to point out that um, in the 1840s, pigments were still hand ground. They weren't machine ground and machine grinding of pigments for paints doesn't really come into play until post-1850. And so if you look in this, um, in the ultraviolet image at the top paint layer, the pigment particles are so small, you can't even see them under the microscope. So this is very much a later machine ground paint versus the earlier hand ground paint. And then just to give you a sense of what Gabriel looks like, we can tell so much from close looking. Gabriel's wing is what I'm showing here. And you can see that the um, current sort of um, tan color underneath, there was this beautiful effect of stripes of orange and red and yellow, which are very consistent with how Gabriel was represented in the Renaissance. And so there have been some major design changes in this vein from what it looked like originally. We also saw evidence in this region of a uh, wax coating that we think was used in order to help with the active flaking going on here and to control corrosion. And then I also wanted to show an example of uh, this wonderful deer from Harrison Company later in the 19th century. Here's a great example of a bullet hole repair and a wonderful gilder size finish. And this shows something that I see in a lot of craftsmen's handbooks from the 19th century, that they recommend using shellac, which has this wonderful orange fluorescence in the ultraviolet light in order to protect outdoor metal surfaces. And so this is something that I very commonly see in weather vanes. And so this is a close-up view of uh, what the piece looks like in the area that we sampled in the neck. And I also wanted to point out, um, you can see how disturbed the layers are in this cross section, that there's three different layers of gilding. This is the um, gilder size from the bottom layer. The second layer is breaking up. And the third layer, um, the paint is kind of pouring down into the second layer. So this black line here is the second gilding. And then there's a third gilding on top. And so again, this um, speaks against the notion that these objects were stripped and regilded. And it's wonderful in terms of what we can learn about how these objects were cared for and used during their working lifetimes.
So this is a much less disturbed example. Again, you see that wonderful shellac layer in the ultraviolet and all of the Gilder's um, sizing layers. And the antlers have a similar history. And then we did molecular analysis to confirm that we had the period technology, the chrome yellow and clay. And in fact, that's what we saw here. So I wanted to talk a little bit about this fabulous goat that's in the exhibit that dates to uh, about 1880 and the maker is not known. And he has um, the most intact Finnish history that I've ever seen on uh, weather vane. And so I wanted to give everyone an example to have a look at this. Um, we have four intact gilding campaigns. And so again, the gold leaf is so thin, it's very hard to see, but every time there's the yellow gilder size, that thin black line is the gold leaf on top of it. So we can count one, two, three, four layers of um, gold leaf, one on top of the other. And then we have uh, this um, priming layer applied directly on top of the gold leaf. So no attempt to reduce the original surface, but just the craftsperson went right over the top of it. And again, we see the presence in ultraviolet light of these early shellac um, containing layers. What looks so bright up towards the top of the cross section, those are plant resins like pine resin um, that are actually very good in terms of protecting the vein from the environment. And then in between oil containing layers tend to be quite dark. And then here the gilding layers at higher magnification are a little bit clearer. And we can actually separate them out into the four different campaigns that were applied by the artist. And so this vein was very well taken care of by the family that owned it and um, very um, nicely maintained. And again, we have that wonderful phenomenon of this knowledge in the 19th century that is um, somewhat lost today that you would wanna use a lead sulfate white and um, when you were working outside rather than a uh, lead carbonate white. So I'll switch over to Nick now to talk about conservation decision-making. Um, so it was interesting. I just I love looking at cross sections, so <laughs> you can keep looking at those. It's like reading a story almost. You you can sort of uh, peel back the layers of its history and sort of uh, imagine. Um, I always I always love looking at. I I forgot that we had the slide in here. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, sort of just going back to sort of the seeds I had planted earlier. Um, uh, to, to sort of reassess, um, you know, sort of when I'm looking at these same pieces, I gave a couple examples here on the side of one of the bowls in the exhibition uh, and sort of a, a shot from underneath the weather vane showing sort of this really uh, uh, flaky sort of lifting surface. Um, and so when I'm looking at these pieces, um, how do we as a conser cons conservators decide what to do? Um, and so what I wanted to do is determine, like, I just want to sort of give an idea to the audience, sort of my mindset. Um, and uh, of course, um, we don't have that much time. <laughs> so I just give, I'm going to run through it really fast. But essentially, the question is, as I said before, is like, what is the aim? What is the goal of the treatment? Um, and it really varies. Uh, across the board in terms of uh, who uh, the stakeholders are, uh, the philosophical approaches, what is the purpose of it. Um, but when I approach an object, then my first back, my first uh, sort of duty is to do background research. I do a review of the literature, a histor art historical, um, the technological histories, the review of conservation literature um, and scientific literature to sort of understand and contextualize the object and think about sort of the parameters of a treatment uh, design. Uh, moving forward in sort of also within that, that same purview of imagining um, who is the interested parties? Is this for a museum? Is this for a private client? And how does that play a role? Again, we're looking at the condition, we're looking at the materials, um, figuring out uh, 
at what level, at what stage, is it accelerated? Is it really unstable? Is it stable? Do we have to do anything? Um, and sort of that's uh, sort of assessed by visual examination, but also looking at it under the microscope. Um, there are other variety of other imaging techniques that we can employ. Um, Jennifer referenced UV illumination, but I can look at it with just a UV light, a black light that can tell a lot about finishes on the surface um, before I have to assess um, or reach out to uh, scientists. We have access to X radiography, depending on what institution you're working at. Private practice is a little harder. Um, microscopy, um, very often, sometimes uh, private conservators have microscopes themselves. They can look at samples under the under the microscope and understand quite a lot. But um, again, you know, depending on how far uh, both the client or the institution wants to take that investigation, um, that can go further again into the physical and chemical tests to sort of understand, um, really truly understand what's going on. Uh, this is also again, sort of woven into all these other sort of investigations before in terms of his background, the research, the literature, um, and we can really dig deep, um, but essentially, um, bringing it back is uh, very often the conservator's place in this position of determining the future state of an object. So that's, and I say here, either done in collaboration with or in contradiction to the interested parties, and it sounds a little bit controversial, but uh, bear with me. <laughs> but essentially the point is that, again, like I said, this is a conversation and um, everyone's sort of coming at it with, we all have the best intentions. But very often as a conservator, I'm usually trying, I find myself in a position of speaking for the interests of the object. Um, and this is sort of part of those, the, the ethical, um, uh, the ethical decisions that I make is I have to approach uh, the conservation, the decisions for this cultural heritage, irrespective of its monetary or financial value. I don't really consider these things. I don't look, think about it or look at it. I don't really care ultimately. Um, I mostly think of it as, I really want the piece to survive in in uh, into the future to be valued by people and appreciated by people um, in as original a condition uh, and material uh, as possible. Um, and so this is sort of all these kind of considerations come into sort of the design of a conservation approach. And so I wanted to bring that uh, sort of as a so a full circle. Um, to sort of uh, contextualize. And it's sort of brought into sort of what Jennifer was describing in past uh, slides is sort of this investigation. And so um, all of that is brought into, uh, and I can, we can go on forever, I think, <laughs> in, terms, in terms of looking and thinking about these materials. And we, we focus most of this talk on the surfaces, but we can go into a whole other thing about wood and iron and all these substrates that it's, you know, it's applied onto um, uh, sort of where are these exceptions in terms of its finish, the issues with using wax or silicon resins, uh, you know, what are the philosophical approaches of, of a strip surface? What do you do? I mean, we can, this is like multiple courses inside of one, but um, I just want to give sort of this uh, snapshot into sort of my uh, train of thought in terms of how I would approach the conservation of a weather vane. I wholeheartedly agree with Nick here that we could we could go on for hours, but we know you guys don't have all night, and there's so so much we could talk about with the substrates that um, maybe we'll come back for round two sometime and talk about the substrates. But I just wanted to think about you know what a truly great finish is on a folk art object and what makes that finish and. For me, it's really, you know, the wind, the sun, and the air, and the sea that creates what we all desire so much, which is um, a piece of living history, basically, in these objects. And uh, with that, um, I know we're over time, and I want to have time for everyone else to speak. So I want to thank you all so, so much for having us and for your um, kind and generous attention. Yes, uh, echoing Jennifer's sentiments entirely. Thank you both so much for um, this really, truly a master class in um, conservation and conservation science, uh, taking us both into 
um, you know, methodologies and your approaches, but also this closer look at objects from the exhibition. So this is the point in the program where we love to invite everyone who's on this call to submit your questions. Um, we ask that you put them in the Q&A and then we'll respond to as many of these as possible that we can. Uh, but we have one that's here in the chat that um, is going back to painted surfaces and asking about how we can conserve painted surfaces from exposure to light, which is, um, I think you mentioned this, Jen, when you were talking about um, the Gabriel vein being in the, um, in the galleries and more protected now. Yes, um, light, uh, we talk about, um, you know, the different agents of uh, degradation that are going to act on these veins and for painted surfaces, depending upon what pigments are present in the paint, some of them can actually be extremely light sensitive. And that is one of the reasons why these works um, were repainted. And a lot of the times it depends on whether you have a mineral based pigment like a blue ultramarine versus a uh, blue dye like indigo that fades very quickly, although um, it was used in painting as well as in textiles. And so one of the common misconceptions I think about paints is that if you remove them from the ultraviolet light, it's okay. But in fact, many pigments react to visible light as well. And so that's why if you walk into the textiles gallery at the Met, the lights are down very low. And the, that has to do with the photosensitivity of those dyes. Oh, I would just also add to that um, photodegradation also breaks down uh, a variety of different um, materials. So even on, you might not see the degradation, there's degradation occurring on the microscopic level that we might not sort of experience until much later. And then I think uh, there's also, um, I think there's uh, some paintings at the Vatican Museum they were talking about, where some of the pigments, when it doesn't get enough, it, does, it needs light to be fully uh, enjoyed. Like I guess when it's in the dark, the, the paint colors or the, the pigments in the binder recede and you don't see the painting for what it was. So actually sometimes, it's like, that's why it's always very challenging because these you know, objects, you know, painted surface is very, again, complex and it depends very heavily on the binding media. And like, like Jennifer said, the pigments and their, their uh, chemical makeup. I think you make a good point also about um, the conditions under which the works were meant to be viewed. Um, and one of the pleasures of this exhibition is seeing these objects up close um, and in great light, which wouldn't, you know, when they're on a building, definitely not possible. So we have a great question here um, from Erwin Warren asking, do you, did you have any surprises or wow moments when looking at these veins? And do you, I'll add on to that, do you have any favorites? Oh boy. Okay. Um, some surprise moments for me was how many times when um, I pick them up, they still have bullets rattling around <laughs> inside of them that the bullet has may have entered, but not actually gone through to the other side. And um, when you look at the bullet holes in these veins, you can actually see the different calibers that they were shot with see sometimes that it looks like they look like they were shot with bb guns and so it didn't actually go through the um the sheet copper and um but i i think the big wow moment for me was that everything that we're seeing here is so different than the conventional wisdom of what we were expected to see and i feel like uh, we've almost created as many questions as we've answered in terms of who are you hiring to regild or repaint your weather vane and under what circumstances is this uh, taking place and so uh, I'm just very interested in um, trying to find some information about the craftspeople who were doing this work in the 19th century and in the early 20th century and Oh, favorites. Um, favorites is um, really, really hard. I'm, I'm obviously a huge fan of uh, the goat that we looked at and the train. And then coming up next, um, let me just advance the slide. The Selkie, I think, just has the most amazing finish. And so anytime you've got like 
a really soft finish like this. I think that's something that's just so desirable in these objects in terms of, again, that sort of patina of history. Did you want me to say anything? Yes, <laughs> Nick, any, any wow moments for you? I'll keep it short. Um, I think I think when I walked through the exhibition, I was really impressed with the variety. Um, I I don't I, I mean I, I've been around weather beans, but I never really you know it's kind of unique to be able to walk into a space and see this variety of both surfaces, but also forms, shapes, uh, you know, sort of constructions, uh, materials, and sort of design approaches. And I, I was kind of impressed by that. I think me as a conservator, I tend to, uh, I really like how, thinking about how they're made. So of course, I think that what drew my um, attention was the wooden pattern. Was it the fox or dog? I think it was the dog. Dog, yeah. See, that was, I loved looking at that because you sort of see the hand of the, the craftsman who you know took the original design and sort of made it into something, which of course the copper was based off of. And, you're getting closer. It's almost like seeing the original sketches uh, underneath the painting. Uh, for me, that's sort of what excites me. And uh, I think when we had walked through, I, I drew these comparisons. I was doing research on the Casterbury House staircase for the map. And um, the, uh, the carver that's been attributed to the staircase there uh, is Edward Pierce. And I saw um, a reference and another book about how he had carved a the wooden pattern for the weather vane that sits atop the St. Mary Le Bow uh, church in London. And that would have been around 1680s. And uh, I bring this up uh, because I think Edward Pierce was confused, was mistaken for being Grinley Gibbons, which is considered one of the greatest carvers in Britain's history. So it also kind of gives you an idea of the caliber of craftsmen that were sort of involved with the making of weather vanes. And, you know, I, I think that there's something to be said, you know, even in terms of the, the transition of these skills brought to America as well. And I think um, you can see that also reflected in the, the show. Um, there's, you know, great design and craftsmanship employed. And so um, I just thought it was an interesting sort of, uh, um, interesting uh, reference absolutely and um the the gallery where you have those process um or sort of more of an explanation of the process i think does lend um more appreciation just to the skill involved in these especially with the sulky you know just the detail there um so we do have a question here that's going back to this, um, what you raised around uh, some of the ethical issues. And um, Dan asks, setting aside issues of preservation, preventing further deterioration um, and commercial market value, could you speak to what you consider to be the ideal finish stage, if there is one, um, to preserve or restore? And what do you do when your belief of what's best for the object conflicts with um, the owner or stakeholder? What a complex question. I think I'll let Nick start there if that's okay. <laughs> I think, you know, you have to sort of engage um, with the whoever the stakeholders are. Um, I think there's a lot of stakeholders out there who, you know, are uh, connoisseurs themselves and they, they also bring a lot of knowledge to the conversation. But and sometimes um, not so much. So you're sort of having this conversation that's that could be both educational um, or just a conversation between uh, passionate, enthusiastic people. So it you know it, it varies. It really does. And I think you know sort of having that conversation openly and being honest, in my opinion, being honest about sort of the the sort of uh, material makeup of what's on the surface and what is isn't possible and its stability. I think is um, my personal opinion is the best way forward um, and sort of um, just discussing that. I mean, um, you might not always agree in terms of um, the treatment decisions in terms of preservation, but I think that was not part of the question, right? I don't wanna 
um, what do you do? The, the second half of the question is, what do you do when your belief of what's best for the object conflicts with that of the owner? Uh, yeah, it is tricky. Sometimes I walk away from doing the treatment. Sometimes I'll, I'll, I won't, I refuse, I will refuse to do the work on the piece if, if a client is asking me to do something that I'm not comfortable with ethically. Um, and those are the sort of lines that I have to draw. Maybe someone else will do it. I don't know. And it could also affect the long term, you know, the health and the stability of the object or its worth. I, I bring my professional experience and, you know, uh, knowledge to, to bear. And I, you know, you put your reputation on the line for it too. So there's all these sort of aspects at play. These are really complex, complex questions. And um, I think we're all really grateful for the frankness also that the way that you're inviting us into an understanding around the challenges of this work. One thing that I do want to add with respect to this question in terms of um, the ideal finish stage to um, restore or preserve, I did work on one vein that was a magnificent form. It was a uh, one-off. It didn't come from any of the makers and unfortunately uh, any of the known makers it, it had been and this was from like the Shenandoah Valley it had been coated with aluminum roof paint unfortunately and when we did um you know our micro sampling we could see this magnificent finish history this magnificent polychromy underneath this aluminum roof paint and Boy, would I have liked to <laughs> have seen what that looked like without the uh, that aluminum surface. And so, yeah, I would want to go back to something earlier than that that was more true to the intent of the artist. The question then comes is what is what is possible? Yep. <laughs> well, what yep. is possible? Like you know, there are there are definitely limitations to what a conservator can do, and even what we have available to us. So, as much as we might want to return to a previous state or appearance sometimes it's not entirely possible. And even if you can get to a certain stage, there are there might be sacrifices or concessions made along the way. I always think of uh, like, uh, was it um, The Last Supper, right? It's got, you know, so many hundreds of years of, ex you know, of exposure and it was already falling apart before the artist was finished with it. And so you have all these layers and when they restored it, they had to choose one of the versions to bring it back to. And even then, there's all these questions about what is, is it really what it was at that time? So even if you remove that aluminum uh, layer from the piece, is that really what it would have looked like? So then, you know, all these questions are, and it wasn't worth the risk of removing it and potentially disrupting the layers beneath and all these sort of questions are at play. So, and this is where collaboration is especially important in terms of reaching out to uh, other experts that might be able to sort of answer these questions. I wouldn't be able to answer that. We can discuss those kinds of things with maybe a biochemist or another engineer or a scientist that could, you know, figure out a way, you know, you could team up with the university maybe to figure out how that could be possible to remove that layer safely. I think you're, um... This conversation is also helping us to understand the subjectivities of this field and um, how you work together to um, try to uh, make decisions and decide when when to return objects. I see that it is 7.15 and I do see that we still have some more questions um, that are unanswered. So I think we'll just, we'll stay on the call for just a few more minutes um, and, and we'll quickly get to these. Um, there's a question here from Cynthia asking how, um, were there any uh, Midwestern veins in the exhibition, and we, you did show us that one, um, the witch from Ohio. Um, how do Midwestern veins differ from those that we see on the East Coast? Do they differ? Do, is this something that you can speak to, Jen, or is this something that we should direct um, maybe to the catalog? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would say you get a lot of the expected um, forms uh, that you might think you would see in the Midwest in terms of agricultural forms. There's, uh, I've seen a large number of plow veins. They're usually not three-dimensional, they're two-dimensional plows. And uh, there's um, uh, 
in the exhibit a wonderful um, pig vein. I don't know when he's from, but there are some terrific pig veins out there. And um, so, yeah, absolutely. We see them in the Midwest uh, as well. And um, it may be that, the, um, you know, there could have been more from, from the show, but uh, certainly I think because of the way this country was settled, the East Coast has a tremendous um, collection of, of these historic objects. And to close, to close our Q&A, we do have a question about fakes. And if you could speak to um, maybe telling us a little bit about when you discovered a fake, how you made the discovery. Um, I, and, you know, is this something that can you look, you know, just by looking, um, are you able to discern um, an original or a fake? Or is this something that really required um, the level of technical analysis that you shared with us tonight? Good question. I mean, sometimes if you have an artificial patina that's been applied to um, the sheet copper, you can actually see the brush marks of the application of the patina. And so that's something that you can see visually. And I don't have a good example of a fake in these slides, but um, I talked about the way that the copper minerals kind of grow out of the surface of a vein when they form over time, naturally over, you know, decades or centuries. You don't see that on the fake veins. Instead, their surfaces are very um, almost polished and smooth. And then when we see, you know, fakers applying gilding, often they'll grind up gold leaf in um, like polyurethane floor finish and dot it onto the vein to make it look gold or um, polyvinyl acetate, which is, um, or polyvinyl alcohol, which is Elmer's glue. And we see that um, gold dotted onto the surface of the vein with that too. And so, yeah, the um, certainly the molecular analysis tells us a lot about um, anachronistic materials or materials that just can't be from the period because they haven't been invented yet. Incredible. I, you know, your stories are, are really so wonderful. And I want to thank you both for this um, fascinating discussion, for sharing so much of your work um, with us this evening. For everyone who's on the call, thank you so much for being here. We hope you'll join us for another program soon. And of course, um, see the American Weather Veins exhibition in person if you're able. Um, and until then, uh, we hope you're, you all stay well. Thank you.